So hey guys welcome back to my channel today we are gonna see what if Harry Potter lived and trained by Batman this is last part 1 hope you enjoyed this. So let's begin if there had been any question before, whether the teachers at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry were subject to any sort of regulation or mandatory teaching classes, if they had ever acquired a teaching license or were instructed in how to best properly control a classroom and to teach in a way that was engaging and professional, it was now abundantly obvious that the answer was in the negative. Pipe down everyone. Class is about to start. I promise you one, one, tear miss this. Once more the students had firmly segregated themselves based on the color of their robes. It was starting to become sincerely annoying, the way that the children limited their social groups, and how the faculty seemed to encourage the segregation. In response to Hagrid's bellowing the conversation of the wandering teenagers outside of the grounds keeper's hut died down to soft whispering. Right then. Today we are going to be learning about hippogriffs. Hagrid turned slightly and presented the already visible hippogriffs to the class. Batman, in the back of the group caught some of the Slytherins jabbing each other and making fun of the teacher. I had no clue. I'm so glad he told us or I never would have seen that one coming. Batman narrowed his eyes but allowed the slight, as it was not disturbing anything, and it was not disruptive. Furthermore, discipline was not his problem at this moment. Hagrid went on ignorant to the teasing that was going on directly in front of him. Now, who can tell me about hippogriffs? Hermione, before the giant had even finished his question a young lady in the front had her hand up and was wiggling it around as if she had something to say of the utmost importance. It hadn't escaped Batman's notice that none of the class had even attempted to raise their hands, even if it appeared as if they knew the answer. Hippogriffs are creatures with the head front legs and shoulders of an eagle, and the body and hind legs of a horse. They have steely beaks, orange eyes and deadly talons. Hippogriffs are proud and should only be approached with the hippogriff's permission. Hippogriffs are required to have a disillusion charm cast on them every day by those who own them in order to avoid detection by muggles. Batman raised his eyebrow beneath the cowl at the recitation, as that is what it was. Batman had no doubt that the girl had only memorized a text, and did not take the time to comprehend what it might mean before she filed it away in memorization. Hagrid however could not have been more pleased with the answer. Excellent. Five points tear Gryffindor. I couldn't have said it better myself. Now, just like Hermione said, hippogriffs are proud creatures. You don't never want to be on the wrong side of one. Hippogriffs are easily offended, so when you do see one you'd best treat it with respect. In order to get close to one, you have tear ask it. First thing you do when he notices ye, is tear bow, real low like but keep eye contact cause they don't like anything shifty. Then, if he bows back terrier, you can go up and touch, I am. And if he don't, then run away as fast a yay can cause those talons will take your arm off, now, who wants to go first? All at once, the class took a very large step backward, all except for one boy in the front. Harry. Well come on then Don, be shy. Before Harry could explain himself or rejoin the group he was under the weight of Hagrid's large hands and behind guided, forcibly manhandled towards the post that the hippogriff was tethered to. Batman narrowed his eyes and shifted himself along the shadows of the hut, and over into the tree line so that he would be in a more direct position to stop anything should it go amiss. By this point it was inevitable that it would. Now this little buoy's name is Buckbeak. Go on say hello. There were several giggles from the group some ten feet away though neither Hagrid nor Harry seemed to notice. Instead Harry looked up to Hagrid with disbelieving eyes and upon seeing the sincerity of the request in Hagrid's face, turned back to the hippogriff. H hello Buckbeak. The hippogriff lazily shifted its weight and settled its gaze on where Harry was standing not three feet from its beak. Hagrid gave Harry a rough nudge to the back that nearly sent him to the ground as he fed the boy his next instruction. Quick now, Harry. Bow, real low as low as you can manage, but don't break eye contact. As Hagrid stepped back Harry looked to the creature and gulped before he shakily bowed at the waist. His eyes opened wide, obviously doing their best to stay open and resist blinking or breaking eye contact in any way. When a long moment passed and the hippogriff had yet to bow in return Batman moved silently to the edge of the shadows of the forest, ready to spring. It was in that moment that the hippogriff lowered its head and bowed one knee. Very good Harry. You can go up and touch, I am now if you like. The boy quickly gained confidence as he slowly rose with the hippogriff and tentatively pet his beak. The boy turned with a beaming smile back to Hagrid. 
This isn't bad at all. Hagrid let out a laugh as he walked forward now. Course not. I think you're about ready to ride, I am now. What before Harry could get out any more protest than that he was being plucked from the ground and set on top of the hippogriff and with a very firm swat to the hindquarters the hippogriff was sent trotting off to fly around the castle. Batman watched the boy go as he listened to the gasps of awe coming from the class. Hagrid beamed with pride at the seeming approval coming from his class. Harry's shouts of elation were audible as the hippogriff floated over the lake and came back around to land with the sound of the solid impact of its hoofs and talons on the ground. The hippogriff trotted to a halt before the class and Hagrid clapped, and plucked Harry off of the creature's back. He pulled a slab of steak from within his coat and threw it up in the air for the hippogriff to catch. Good boy Buckbeak. Magnificent show Harry. You're a natural. Now does anyone else want to have a go? This time the entire class looked eager to participate. They raised their hands and waved them around shouting, please, and, me next. I'll go. If Potter can do it, it can't be that hard. Draco Malfoy pushed to the front of the group but didn't stop there, instead he continued to march forward, he spoke to the hippogriff. You're just a trained animal. You probably can't even understand what I'm saying. A big stupid pet for the oaf. You don't scare me. Get back. Before Hagrid could even shift his weight to think about pushing Draco out of the way, Buckbeak had reared up on its hind legs its talons extended as it let itself fall towards Draco's terrified face and his raised arm. Like a phantom Batman shot out of his resting place and stood in front of Draco, causing him to stumble back and fall on his rear with an oomph. Now directly underneath the rearing front limbs Batman caught the ankles of Buckbeak's pedaling claws as they came down. In anticipation of the immense weight of the animal Batman allowed his body to coil and bend at the waist arms and knees as he allowed the creature's downward momentum. Just as Batman was about to be crushed he slid out from underneath the animal and abruptly stood up, maintained his grasp on the creature's feet. Buckbeak's front half was abruptly twisted to the side and his fall was broken by his left shoulder, his hind quarters naturally followed. Batman let go and leapt away to a safe range. Draco had scrambled backwards as soon as he had fallen and was out of the way. Hagrid was standing in front of all of the students his arms extended as a human shield. Batman did not move from his spot, still in the hippogriff's line of sight, but away from the group of children. There were short screams as the hippogriff huffed and started to move. It rocked back and forth to swing itself back upright before it stood. It immediately turned towards Batman. It let out a screech before it walked, not trotted or cantered, but walked over towards Batman's position. The creature never broke eye contact with him and Batman never did either. As the hippogriff approached Batman rose out of his combat ready position of a low crouch, but kept his knees unlocked and his muscles coiled. The pace of the animal indicated that it did not want to fight. Batman had no desire to either so he communicated that with his body language, just as the hippogriff was with his pace. The hippogriff slowed as it got nearer from a walk to a slow shuffle Batman made no other move, as the creature got close. His kept his muscles tight, and still, a completely motionless black pillar. The hippogriff huffed before it stopped directly in front of him. The creature slowly extended its head and gently bumped Batman's chest with its beak, breathing in deeply through its nose before he withdrew. The creature then took two steps backward before it lowered itself to its knees and bowed its head to the ground, its eyes locked on Batman's. Ignoring the class of whispers and exasperated noises Batman thoroughly examined the hippogriff, assessing its intent. The tension in the creature as Batman continued to ignore its bow was visibly building. It was not poised to attack, however, but flee if it met Batman's rejection as evidenced by its weight shifting back and away, rather than forward as time stretched on. Now certain of Buckbeak's intentions and anxieties, Batman bent neatly at the waist, just enough to be recognized as a bow. Buckbeak gave one last dip of its head before it rose and walked the two steps towards Batman, now playfully nudging Batman's shoulders and attempting to get underneath Batman's cape. It was that moment that Batman was sure that Buckbeak had been spending time with the Thestrals he'd met the night before. Unlike last night, however, he now had an audience and did not want to risk the reputation he was building. He gave the hippogriff a low growl in his throat and a glare. That was all that was needed to get the creature to back off. It dipped its head before it walked back over to the post it had been tethered to before. With Buckbeak under control Batman turned back to the rest of the class to be met with a crowd of open mouths and wide eyes, including Hagrid. 
Batman searched the group of students before he found the one he was looking for. Batman walked up to the group of students and stood in front of Hagrid, staring down at a blonde teenager who was hiding behind the giant's massive legs. Batman looked from Hagrid to Draco to make sure that it was clear he was addressing the both of them, before he spoke alternating his gaze between the two. Where I come from, do you know what we call people who ignore danger? Both Hagrid and Draco shook their heads. Batman waited a moment and glared at the two before he turned his back to them. Dead. With that Batman walked calmly back up to the castle, leaving a silent group of third years and a groundskeeper behind him. Would someone tell me why I'm doing this again? No one is making you go wrong. And let you two go alone to get eaten by that bloody vampire? Not a chance, Hermione huffed as she waited for Harry to get his cloak and the map out of his trunk. He can't be a vampire because we saw him out in the daylight Ronald. Well he was covered head to foot with that bizarre cloak he wears he didn't have to be in the sunlight. His chin was uncovered, he could have put on some of that muggle sun repellent my dad was talking about this summer. Sunscreen wouldn't make a difference to a vampire. He still could have guys. Both Ron and Hermione stopped to look at Harry who had moved towards the door, his shoulder missing and a map clutched in his hand. Are you two going to keep bickering like an old married couple or come with me? They both blushed before they quickly went towards the door with Harry to go down to the common room. I still say we don't have to do this. The cloak was swept over the three of them as they arranged themselves under it, a light under the cloak making sure they didn't trip over themselves. We've already decided this is the only way we're getting answers. We don't know if this guy is working for Voldemort, Harry rolled his eyes at the flinch, or Sirius Black or even why Professor Dumbledore would let him in the castle. He's obviously important. There has to be something going on that we don't know. This is the best way to find out what it is. All talking ceased as the portrait of the fat lady swung open, causing the fat lady to stutter in her snoring for a moment before she settled back down. The three teenagers shuffled down the hallway before they settled into a rhythm that wouldn't have them stepping on each other's toes. Which way are we going? There was an exasperated shish not so loud, from Hermione before Harry got a chance to answer. The map says he's in the library. We'll find out what he's looking for. That will give us a clue what he wants for sure. Come on. The trio shuffled along again. They heard Filch coming down the hallway with his loud footsteps and grumbling, so they pressed themselves up against the wall until he passed. Luckily, Mrs. Norris was nowhere around to give them away. They continued on until they came up to the large double doors and slowly pried them open to get inside. The door was completely silent, the trio having known it would moan if opened too quickly. The only indication that the door opened at all was the air pressure equalizing itself with a small gust, fluttering the edges of the cloak that covered the trio. Not two seconds later the draft of new air reached the back of the library, so diluted at that range that it was completely unnoticeable to even trained senses. However the two candles Batman had lit to read by, which had been completely steady in the stagnate air up to this point. Both gave a single simultaneous flicker. Batman's eyes snapped up to the candles in the brief flux of light. He narrowed his eyes before he silently let the archive newspaper he was reading fall to the table and he easily climbed up to the top of the bookcases, up into the dark ceiling. Batman gathered his cape so it would not hang over the edge of the bookcases and crouched as he walked along the planks of wood towards the doorway, intent on seeing whom his visitor was. In the silent room he could hear the faint attempts at stealth on the stone floors. The hard material amplifying the noise up to his ears. Batman honed in on the noise but as he moved closer, the soft steps abruptly stopped. Batman narrowed his eyes but continued to move forward slowly and scanned the aisle ahead of him. When Batman had gone as far as he was sure he could track the noise from when it had been audible, he came to a halt and opened his ears. He instantly became aware of fearful breathing directly below him. Batman scowled. Invisible then. Normally Batman could turn on his thermal vision and the invisible nature of his assailant would be rendered impotent, however his thermal imaging lenses were something that ran on electricity and not available to him. His course of action now would be to wait for the intruder to reveal him or herself, or approximate their location to the best of his ability and incapacitate. Batman did not know the motive of his visitor, so he opted to see if he could find out. He waited patently for any signs that the perpetrator to reveal himself or move. He didn't have to wait long. It was at most two minutes before three teenagers had pulled some sort of fabric off of themselves. The source of the fearful breathing then became readily apparent, as well as two other teenagers. 
one he recognized as Harry Potter, the other, the girl who always answered questions with memorization. Where the bloody hell is he? It says he should be right on top of us. The redhead peered at the map Harry Potter was holding. The three looked up to the ceiling. Batman leaned away from the edge and wrapped himself in the black of his cape. Their eyes passed right over the shadows that Batman occupied before they were back to the piece of paper in Harry Potter's hand. The girl took the piece of paper from Harry and examined it. Do you think there is something wrong with the map? Harry allowed the girl to examine the piece of paper as he shrugged his shoulders. I wouldn't know. We could ask Fred and George later, but even if it was I wouldn't know how to fix it. The girl handed the map back to Harry who pocketed it before gathering the now visible cloak from the floor. Well what are we supposed to do now? Do we even know if he was here anymore? Harry looked around before he fixed his gaze further down the aisle at a corner. He might have been. I think I see a light coming from further that way. Come on, there might be something there. The trio walked none to silently down the aisle they were currently in and turned a corner, to go one aisle over and down another aisle. When they found the small table and the two candles their steps became quicker and surer. Batman followed them back to his table. Well, the redhead was cautious to approach the table, still looking up at the bookcases. He's looking up stuff about black. At least that's what it looks like. All of these are old, from twelve years ago when my parents died. The girl leaned over the table and looked through the papers. Why would he be looking up serious black? If you were working with him wouldn't he already know all of this? Unless he's looking for something else. The girl invited herself to sit down at the table. The other two took her lead and sat themselves at the other two chairs surrounding the tables picking up papers for themselves. Harry shifted through the papers as he spoke. If he doesn't know about black he could be looking up this stuff to help. Then he could be on our side. We thought Snape was the bad guy and he ended up saving us. The reed head rolled his eyes. Barely. Ron. The girl gave Ron a sharp swat with a folded newspaper. Well he's still a greasy git. He is a professor and he saved our lives. Ron grumbled and flicked a paper up violently, obviously in disagreement but not willing to get into an argument right then. The three became silent for a moment. Batman patiently watched, still as the gargoyles he often perched from, and waited for something else to happen. It was another twenty minutes before Harry put the paper down. Hermione, I'm not seeing anything else in common here. He obviously was just looking up things about Sirius Black. We still don't know anything. Hermione put down her own paper. There has to be something here we can use. We're just not seeing it. No way. Hermione and Harry both turned to Ron who was looking at the paper in his hand with amazement. What? What did you find? Ron looked up before he folded the paper and turned it around. Can you believe this complete broom maintenance kit was only two Galeleons? And that is before the discount? Both Hermione and Harry gave Ron a blank look. A blush rose to his cheeks as he turned the paper back to himself. Well it is a bloody steal. Not all of us are made of gold you know. Hermione sighed as she put down her paper. We aren't going to find anything else here tonight. I think it's time for us to go. We must have been gone for at least an hour by now. Harry put his paper down as well. Okay, we'll figure this out another night. Come on Ron. Batman watched as the trio started to move and decided that he had gotten all the information he was liable to get. Now it was time to dissuade them from their plans of following him again. Batman allowed himself to fall from the edge of the bookcase. He grasped the edges of his cape as he fell to the floor, landing with only a whisper. The air from his descent blew the candles out as he rose to a standing position. Bloody hell! Ron recoiled his knees hitting the back of the chair and falling back into it with a scape and a thud. Harry and Hermione had bothered Ron their wands, Ron doing so after he had picked himself back up. Batman didn't flinch or make a move to draw his own in retaliation. Leaving so soon? Harry regripped his wand and spoke with confidence. What do you want? Why are looking up Sirius Black? Batman took a step forward walking towards the table to put all of the newspapers into a neat stack to be returned to where he had gotten them. He walked into the midst of the three, brushing directly past Harry's outstretched arms still undaunted by the wands pointed at him. I'm not here to fight you. None of the wands went down. Batman collected the newspapers and picked them up. He turned to face the three, as he spoke. Don't follow me again, or you won't like what you find. You have no place in this. 
Batman turned to walk back down the aisle and return the papers to where he found them. A madman is loose and trying to murder me. He betrayed my parents and now he's coming for me. I deserve to know what's going on. It's my life at stake. Batman didn't stop and instead continued to the end of the aisle before he disappeared around the corner. Harry ran to the end to follow, Ron and Hermione following behind, but when they got there, Batman had vanished. The trio made it without incident back to their dorms. Harry had singularly been focused on what had happened until he reached into his pocket and found it empty. His eyes widened and he checked all possible hideaways on his person before he turned to Ron who was looking at him like he was crazy. Ron, the map, it's gone. If Batman were accused of obsession over the case of Sirius Black because tracking down criminals was something that was familiar and comforting in this strange new world, Batman would vehemently deny it. Indeed the only reason that Batman was using his current facilities with such vigor was because while he was here he was the most equipped to deal with the likes of an escaped mass murderer and it would be foolish to let his expertise go to waste and put others in danger. This was what had lead to Batman's presence in the library in the first place. Batman had established his security, obtained a discreet way to properly fuel and maintain himself, mastered a defense against all of the beings and creatures immediately in his vicinity. Having little else to do or accomplish, it was only fitting that now that Batman had his own safety established and under control that he should work towards the safety and security of others. Naturally the first place to start this task was with research on the most relevant threat, that of the escaped mass murderer. Batman was disappointed, but not surprised, at what he found. According to the records he could deem reliable, Sirius Black had gone to prison without a trial. Something that Batman found very irritating. Besides the lack of due process it seemed that the sequence of events that occurred leading up to the arrest of Sirius Black were not confirmed with any hard evidence beyond that of a disembodied finger and a lot of hearsay from people who did not know what was going on as it happened. There was no solid evidence to support the conviction of Sirius Black, or enough evidence to confirm the death of Peter Pettigrew. Batman had seen enough missing body parts to know that a missing finger was not going to kill anyone, at least not quickly. Also to the best of Batman's knowledge there was not a spell or any magic that could be preformed that could vanish a person except for a particularly small and specific extremity. If there was one thing that Batman did not like in his criminal cases, it was loose ends. In the case of Sirius Black and Peter Pettigrew, it seemed that there were hardly any ends that had been tied up. The persecution and sentencing had happened quickly, or rather not at all, and the greater issue of the defeat of he who must not be named had vastly overshadowed any second guessing of the man's true guilt. And then three nosy teenagers had interrupted his research. This was inconvenient at best. Luckily by this time, Batman had most of his research done or he had known enough to come back to the articles later and have an idea of what to look for. However any further investigating that needed to be done into the murder of Peter Pettigrew was put abruptly on hold as the discovery of an unknown element in the hands of those who could not be trusted with it. In the moment he had had to choose between the cloak and the map. The cloak, an effective means of disguise and deception, could not be trusted in the hands of those without the training or knowledge to use it properly, or to protect it from the possession of those who could do ill with it. The map, a vessel of potentially crippling information, was also an item that needed to be removed from the dubious care of children unable to curb their curiosity enough to resist following an unknown potentially deadly bat creature. The circumstances and resources available to him meant that Batman deemed the map more volatile in the hands of nosy teenagers, and it was on this item that he focused his efforts. The map had been simple enough to lift from the inexperienced and easily deceived teenagers. It was his examination of the article once he had returned to his rooms that proved more troubling. It was obviously of magical operation. The map unfolded many more times than its thickness would indicate and the ink on the paper shifted and moved with the subjects it was tracking. As far as Batman could prove, the map accurately plotted the locations of every person and sentient being in the castle, including a cat by the name of Ms. Norris. Of course the only immediate proof that Batman had of the map's function was the movements and existence of his own marker on the map. This had been Batman's main concern when he confiscated the map. He did not need anyone, especially a group of untrained teenagers, having a means to track or locate him. More alarming was that upon further inspection, it appeared as if all of the names that appeared on the map were the subject's full birth given names. The first manner of business was to determine if this map put his identity in danger and if the three disobedient teenagers had any indication that he was anything other than Batman. 
It was a matter of relief and curiosity to discover that the name written above the indicator of Batman's position was indeed Batman. There were several explanations that sprang to mind in order to explain this anomaly. One was that when Batman had arrived in this dimension he had been in the guise of Batman. This being said, he had technically been, born, with the name here. Another was that the map recognized that most of the deceiving of his true personality took place under the name Bruce Wayne and it had selected the, truer, name. Yet another was that because he was from another dimension, the map was unable to read him properly or decipher his unknown origins. The reason behind the concealment of his name, and only his name, on the map was not of paramount importance, however. Instead of lingering on the phenomenon, Batman laid the map out on the desk in his rooms and settled down to start observing and documenting in a way he had been unable to do up until this point. The surveillance that the map allowed Batman to conduct in lieu of his technology was not what he would have preferred, but it was far superior to having no surveillance at all. Besides determining the extent of the breach in his own security that the map had caused, the second matter of business was to observe and evaluate the persons deemed most dangerous up to this point in time. It was perhaps fortunate that the majority of the castle's inhabitants were asleep as most everyone was aligned in neat rows in their dorms. The lone dot of Albus Percival Wolfick Brian Dumbledore was easily spotted in the rooms connected to the headmaster's office. Cerverus Tobias Snape was also in his rooms, not far from where Batman's own marker sat. Minerva McGonagall, Rubius Hagrid, Remus Lupin all were in their beds at the hour of three in the morning. Batman then moved to look for the three that had tracked him to the library. He found them in Gryffindor Tower. However they were not in their dorms. The three of them were sitting on a couch and an armchair around a fire. Batman studied the three for a moment, wondering what they were going to get themselves into before a cursory glance at the rest of the tower revealed that there was a name out of place. The name stood out, against the rest of the children aligned in neat rows, while this one was askew. Peter Pettigrew Batman stopped for a moment and just examined the name on the page. It was possible that there was a third-year Gryffindor student he was unaware of that was named Peter Pettigrew. However, why that student would be sleeping on top of the trunk at the foot of a bed, rather than on it was not readily apparent. It could be a mistake. Batman had seen with his own misidentification, that the map was not infallible. But then the reason for this particular glitch was not easily forthcoming. It was then that movement off dots nearby on the map caught his attention. He watched as Hermione Jean Granger, Ronald Billis Weasley, and Harry James Potter moved up the stairs into the spots they had left vacant in the uninterrupted rows of sleeping students. He watched as Ron and Harry took up the remaining beds in the Gryffindor third-year dormitories, leaving no extra space for an extra person. And the name Peter Pettigrew remained, motionless at the foot of Ronald Weasley's bed. Class the following day was interesting to say the least. To the rest of the student body it seemed that Batman only appeared for a brief moment, and then completely vanished before the next class was due. Now that Batman was in possession of the map, it was even rarer to catch a glimpse of the man. It had been approximately two weeks now, that Batman had been at the school and the rumors surrounding what he was and why he was there were not lacking imagination. Many of the younger years were convinced that he was a dark wraith, a demon that could disappear in and out of the shadows, and would not hesitate to eat any of them if he became so inclined. The upper years, believed nothing so ridiculous, the most widely believed rumor in this instance was that Batman was a vampire and the reason he disappeared so much was because he couldn't stand the sun. These of course were not the only rumors. Some said that Batman was half dementor, and that he was forever cursed to wander in the shadows in the happiness and cheer out of his own emotions while dampening the happiness of others around him. Others had said that Batman had appeared in the Great Hall because he had been thrown out of the underworld and was being punished. There were a few, however, a small few, who did not believe any of this tripe and were very frustrated that the rest of the student body was coming to such conclusions. It had quickly become apparent who these few were and it did not take long for those already slightly alienated who believed Batman was something different to be ostracized completely for daring to believe that Batman was anything but completely and utterly evil. Shish. Justin, let me see. It's going to be okay sweetie. I have to see so I know if we're going to have to go to Madame Pomfrey. Mandy Thurgood was a seventh year Hufflepuff, and the only reason she wasn't in Ravenclaw was that she had an undeniable need to mother hen. No, I don't want to go to the infirmity. The other boys will just laugh at me and call me stupid for not being able to take care of it myself. Justin Vreeland was a first-year Ravenclaw, 
and he was sporting a sprained ankle from a second year that had sent a tripping hex his was in the hall. Justin, don't listen to them, we know you're not stupid. You are very smart. Why else would I need your help with my potions homework? Bethany Tillima was a first year Hufflepuff. After her first transfiguration class with Batman, the rest of the first years had been wary of being her friend. After Mandy had had her own experience with Batman, she had quickly taken the little Hufflepuff Firsty who could be found sitting alone in the common room, under her wing. Justin still shook his head in refusal to go get medical attention. There was a sigh from the last chair at the table in the library. Look Justin, I know a lot about being clumsy, you really should go get it looked at my Madame Pomfrey. I promise you will feel a lot better and if we're quick about it, no one even has to know that you went. I know all the good shortcuts and detours. Neville Longbottom looked sympathetically to the tear-stained Ravenclaw, his charms homework slightly askew and forgotten at Justin's arrival to the table that had become the unofficial meeting place for the four. Justin finally looked up at the words of the Gryffindor and seemed to actually consider the advice coming from someone who would know about such things. Neville gave the Ravenclaw a small smile as he stood up and held out his hand. Okay. With a sniffle and a wince, Justin shuffled onto his good leg and leaned on Neville's shoulder. Bethany quickly picked up hers and Justin's things, before moving to his other side, while Mandy did the same for her and Neville and secured the rear of their little convoy. The trip the infirmary was slow going, but they did make it without running into anyone who would use their injured party to their own advantage. Madame Pomfrey Mai was not pleased when they arrived. What have you four gotten yourselves into now? Mandy grimaced ever so slightly at the matron. What happened was not Justin's fault. Mandy pursed her lips and answered for Justin who was being maneuvered up onto the bed that was just a little too tall for the diminutive first year. Justin was on his was back to his common room when someone in the hallway fired a tripping hex at him as he was about to go down the stairs. Luckily he caught himself on the banister and all he has is a twisted ankle. Madame Pomfrey tutted as she moved briskly over to the little first year. Justin dear, can you take your shoe off so I can get a better look at that foot? All the answer that Pomfrey got was a small whimper. Madame Pomfrey just shook her head and vanished the shoe and sock. The small ankle underneath was already starting to swell. Madame Pomfrey hummed in disapproval before she waved her wand over the injured extremity. An orange glow emitted from the tip of her wand. Lucky for you it's just a sprain. You will only have to be here for the next half hour while the potion I give you does its job. Another flick of her wand and a vial full of a periwinkle concoction flew to her hand. She uncorked the vial with a pop and handed it to the boy. Drink up and I'll be back in a while to let you go. Your friends may stay as long as they don't make too much of a commotion. She leveled her gaze at the three other students who looked defiantly back or averted their gaze to the ground. With that Madame Pomfrey let them be. Justin grimaced before he pinched his nose, brought the vial to his lips and ate it all down in one big gulp. As soon as he swallowed he started to gag and his face got red. Mandy spotted a glass on the stand beside the bed. Agumenti she quickly handled Justin the water and he edited down, only lowering the glass when it was empty, he regained his breath. Pulpy onions. There was simultaneous recoil from the rest of the group. Neville grimaced as he spoke. Well, your ankle is starting to feel better, yeah? Justin experimentally wiggled his toes and got a twang of pain for his efforts. I think it's getting better. The potion needs more time to work, I guess. There were nods all around and then a sigh of resignation from Bethany at the end of the bed. There's nothing we can do to stop this, is there? The whole school already knows what we think about the Batman, and even if we denied it, people wouldn't believe us. Neville frowned at the tone of resignation in Bethany's voice. You know we couldn't do that anyway, not after he's helped us. The other three put their heads down for thinking of misaligning themselves with the man who had made their lives more manageable. Even though Batman had made no more conscious efforts to help them, his actions were still being perpetuated. Batman was still required to attend the third year potions class with Gryffindors and Slytherins, and while Snape had strategically not paired Batman with Neville again in the hope that Neville would fail, Batman still conducted himself the exact same way he did with Neville with the others, if with significantly less intensity. If Batman were always within earshot of Neville's station, or if Snape seemed to be avoided his more acerbic comments when Batman was around, then it was no direct fault of Batman's. Word of what had happened to Marcus had spread to everyone but the teachers. 
most students were smart enough to avoid talking in front of the paintings and the gossip had avoided authority because of this. As the rumors flew, the harassment Mandy had been experiencing her entire career at Hogwarts abated. The reputation of being placed in Hufflepuff even though she was smarter than most Ravenclaws had most believing she was a complete pushover. Though Mandy was no more or less courageous and stubborn than anyone else, she could not stand up to the entirety of the Slytherin house on her own. Marcus had made more than a few lewd comments about her in the past, and though she wasn't sure, the night that Batman had intervened Mandy had been afraid for her innocence. After her encounter with Batman, no one wanted to risk getting near her bad side. And for the first time in six long years Mandy was left to her schooling in peace. Justin could not prove that Batman lingered in the shadows of the first year flying lessons, even though he was no longer required to attend them, but Justin could have sworn he'd seen the point of his cowl or the flutter of a scalloped cape more than once in the scaffolding of the spectator towers, or in the long shadow they cast on the ground. He admitted to himself it was entirely possible he was making things up, that he was seeing things because his brain was trying to make him feel better about being several tens of feet off of the ground, but Justin liked to think that Batman was there, even if he wasn't, because then he knew he could trust Batman to catch him if he fell. Bethany's reason for believing in Batman was the most tenuous. If anything Bethany had a reason to resent Batman because he had driven any would-be friends away, but Bethany did not see it that way. She saw it as the reason she had gotten to know Mandy, Neville, and Justin, the big sister she had always wanted, the boy who was just as clumsy as she was, and the smartest nicest boy in her year. Bethany saw Batman as the reason she had met her best friends and she would never trade that for anything, and if her friends believed in Batman and wanted to fight for him, she would be more than happy to be by their sides, not just because she was loyal, but because she had been helped by Batman too, and she knew they were right. Mandy heaved a great sigh and spoke with a tone of resignation and defiance. We carry on then, I suppose. Neville smiled hesitantly. We carry on. With the assistance of the map, Batman had had a tolerable day attending his classes. While he disliked relying on the map, in any capacity, he was not so proud that he could not recognize the map for what it was, a tool to help him keep away from the rest of the student population as much as possible. This wasn't to say that Batman couldn't do this without the help of the magical map, but that its use made evasion of any unwanted encounters infinitely easier. So for once, classes had gone by relatively without a hiccup. He was present when necessary, but otherwise, kept to the darkness and out of sight. When the end of the day arrived, it was finally time for Batman to start setting up for the investigation he would be doing in the Gryffindor boys' dormitory. Batman waited for dark to come at the edge of the Forbidden Forest. He did not want to have to sneak all the way from the dungeons to the tower in the dead of night. No one was about to check to make sure Batman was in his assigned living space, and if they were, Batman would be able to check the magical map regularly to see if anyone was approaching. As Batman waited for dusk to fall, he hauled himself up into the canopy of the towering trees and observed his targets on the map as they readied themselves for bed. One by one, he watched as the boys moved to their beds and the corresponding lights by their windows would go out. Batman waited for an hour after all of the lights for the entire tower, not just the level he would be infiltrating, had gone out before he packed the map away and started to move towards the base of the tower. The grapple gun, when reduced to a gas propellant, was rated to shoot a hook 123 vertical feet. The electronic function of the gun more than tripled that height, and it was why Batman had long ago switched to electronic propulsion and retraction. Along with being able to grapple higher, he would not need to climb up the tether himself, rather be quickly reeled in. This was not going to be the case in this instance. It was fortunate that the level of the castle Batman wished access looked to be no more than 80 feet tall. The map indicated it was the seventh floor. This also meant that Batman would not have terribly far to climb. Batman took the grapple from his belt, but instead of aiming upwards, he smacked the butt of the gun against his palm, causing a slat to slide downward and a set of carabiners to fall out with a soft, clink. He held the carabiners in his fist as he aimed the gun for a windowsill one above where he would enter and fired. Due to countless nights of practice the hook hit its mark and settled into a sturdy crevice in the sill with a short, clank. Batman waited a full minute for someone to decide to come to the widow where he had fired the hook, but no lights turned on and a quick glance at the map saw no movement. The carabiners were quickly clamped onto the line, and then to a concealed loop in his chest armor before Batman lifted his feet off the ground and began his ascent. It was not long before Batman reached his target, 
he had climbed up the wall to the side of the window before slowly peering over to get a better look at the window. At worst Batman was expecting iron bars and reinforced glass, in which case he had made sure to bring a full bottle of acid, amounting to about four tablespoons that he kept for emergencies. This however was not the case. There was ironwork in the windows but not in a way that would prevent him from getting in. The windows were set on heavy iron hinges and they were not secured shut with locks so much as latches. Batman had prepared for the best scenario as well. Next to the bottle of acid was a bottle of lubricant. Batman gingerly took this bottle from his belt and liberally oiled every point of metal on metal contact that he could access. It was entirely possible that the window had not been opened in over a hundred years, in that case a little WD-40 was not going to make much of a difference, but regardless Batman was not taking any chances. After that task was done, he shimmed to the side out of sight and waited five minutes for the oil to creep into all of the little cracks and crevasses. While Batman waited he pulled his foot up behind him and pulled the magnet out of the heel of his right boot. When enough time had passed, Batman moved back over to the window and slowly started to bring the powerful magnet closer to the window where the latch was visible on the other side. When Batman felt there was enough pull on the magnet in his hand he slowly moved the magnet up and to the side, causing the only piece of loose metal, the bar keeping the window shut, to move up and over with it. When the latch was undone Batman slowly moved the magnet away setting the loose bar to rest without noise before quickly stuffing the magnet back into the sole of his shoe. Now that the windows were free of constraint, when Batman had pulled the magnet away, the windows had swung outwards slightly with it. Batman moved to the side of the window once more to let anyone decide if the change in air temperature or humidity was going to cause them to wake up. After another five minutes Batman moved back. The oil Batman had applied did its job and the windows were completely silent. Batman unhooked the carabineers from his chest and let them sit on the windowsill until he returned. He took out the map once more and now moved until he was directly on top of the name Peter Pettigrew. Batman found himself looking at the image of an overweight balding rat, sitting in a cage at the foot of Ronald Weasley's bed. If Batman were looking at this from the most obvious standpoint, it would be that Ron Weasley had named his pet rat Peter Pettigrew for whatever unnameable reason, and his entire trip had been for naught. However Batman was a parent, a parent of more than a few sons and knew that the likelihood that a boy, at any age, would name a rat Peter Pettigrew was slim to none. Batman retreated to a shadowy corner of the room to think. First he recalled what he knew about rats, they were hardy creatures, could survive near anywhere, very clever, and were chiefly nocturnal. Batman narrowed his eyes at the rat sleeping soundly at this hour of the night. It was entirely possible that the rat was some magical variety. Batman racked his memory and tried to remember if he had seen anything about rats when he had been researching hippogriffs and thestrals, perhaps having been mentioned as something the animals would eat. He paused when a throwaway comment from the half-giant made its way to the forefront of his brain. Nonsense, I'm sure the headmaster won't mind. The Weasleys have been allowed their pet rat for the past eleven years. Ugly little bugger. Percy brought I am to me once when he had a case of the flu. Strange thing for a rat to catch, but there you go. A rat that was at least eleven years old, it was either magical in some capacity or the parents had kept their children ignorant for a number of years by replacing the pet when it passed. Batman might have been more inclined to believe that the parents were replacing the rat if it were not for the second part of Hagrid's comment. Rats had extremely efficient immune systems. They had carried the plague and not been affected by it themselves. As far as Batman was aware it was very rare for a rat to catch something like the flu, especially one meant for humans. Hagrid himself, the resident expert on magical creatures, had indeed remarked that the rat's ailment was strange and this lent itself towards further exposition of the rat in question. Based upon the research Batman had done on various magical creatures and plants thus far, which was sparse and unreliable Batman would admit, the rat should have some defining feature about it that made it obvious it was magical in some capacity. If the rat was indeed magical it was very likely that it should have something obviously magical about it. As Batman moved towards the rat's cage once more, his gaze drifted, and when he looked up he was met with a very large very open pair of pale blue eyes. Batman halted in his movements, his breathing slowed while his heart raced. This boy, sleeping third from the left, could ruin his entire reconnaissance by simply speaking. The two looked at each other for a long moment, Batman evaluating the boy's intentions and the boy attempting to do the same. Batman could see fear and uncertainty in the boy's eyes, 
he was clearly attempting to figure if it would be safer to speak up, or to stay silent. Batman was in a similar position, attempting to judge whether he would need to make a quick exit, or if he should wait to see the boy's next move. Finally the faintest of breezes drifted its way in from the open window. The stir in the air caused the curtains around the beds and windows to shift and allow a brief flicker of moonlight in through the heavy glass. The light was a brief flicker of a glow, but it was enough. Batman recognized the contours of the boy's face, and the boy recognized the silhouette of the man's cowl. The fear and uncertainty disappeared from Neville Longbottom eyes, and instead trust was shown there. At seeing the anxiety vanish, Batman's posture relaxed ever so slightly. No longer in danger of the boy deciding to wake up his dorm mates, Batman waited for the boy to make the next move. He would need to decide if he could continue his recon mission, or if he would need to abandon it if the boy refused to go back to sleep. When Batman didn't move, a question appeared in the boy's eyes. Batman saw this and slowly shook his head once left and once right. There was disappointment and resignation, but not defiance. The boy nodded his head once before he pointedly closed his eyes and rolled over. Batman remained motionless until he watched the rise and fall of the boy's covers even out and heard a light regular wheeze coming from his bed. Batman shoved all of the thoughts on the boy's actions to the back of his head to address later, right now he was to focus on the opportunity that the boy had decided to provide him. He moved closer to the rat's cage once more. The rat was repugnant. It was balding in awkward places and its skin was wrinkling near its tail. The rat was sprawled out in the cage rather than curled into a tight ball like he had seen most rats prefer. Batman narrowed his eyes as the rat's tail twitched. Everything about the way this rat behaved was very off, but without some concrete proof, the rat could only be proven to be exceptionally strange and nothing more. Batman moved closer still until his face was nearly press against the cage, determined to find some concrete truth one way or the other. But as far as Batman could see, the only thing physically strange about this particular rat, beyond its supposed age and peculiar ugliness, was that it was missing a toe on its front left paw. It was indeed a striking coincidence that this rat, whose name was supposedly Peter Pettigrew, was missing the same appendage that the murdered wizard Peter Pettigrew of 13 years previous had left behind. A scowl appeared on Batman's face, his eyes narrowed as several tumblers clicked into place within his head. It was a good thing that Batman did not believe in coincidences. Batman's hard gaze never left the vermin as he administered two drops of oil to the hinges of the cage, and then slowly and silently undid the latch. Batman scowled when he realized his gauntlets would not fit through the opening. Patiently, Batman removed his right glove and reached for the small capsule of knockout gas he kept in his belt. He maneuvered his fist into the cage without touching anything and while leaning away himself, crushed the capsule in front of the rat's face. Batman waited a few moments before he prodded the rodent's limp form, when there was no reaction, Batman didn't hesitate to scoop the rat out of the cage and lay it on the floor beside him while he put his glove back on and the spent capsule back in his belt. Batman had tested his knockout gas on the rats that infested the Batcave before he had moved to human test subjects, the gas would not harm the rat, even if there happened to be nothing outstanding about it. Replacing the cage door and redoing the latch, Batman now had the pleasure of rappelling back down the tower, back to his own rooms one-handed. As silently as he had entered, he exited the window, shut the glass, and relocked the windows with the magnet of his boot, laying the rat on the sill as he did so, before picking the pest back up and sliding down the tower wall. When he reached the bottom a practiced flick of the cable in his hands dislodged the claw from the windowsill and sent it flying away from the tower to land in the grass with a heavy thunk. Batman collected the long cable before he took out the map once more and made his way back to his rooms. He had approximately 30 minutes to build a suitable cage for his captive before he could figure out how to interrogate a rat, let alone prove that it was the Animagus he suspected it to be. The tracer Batman had left on Neville's wand, no bigger than a grain of rice, and near completely useless within the magical environment, would not be discovered until the boy's first class the next day when he felt an unusual bad shaped bump at the end of his wand. It was a tiny gesture, but it was enough. Neville only smiled a small smile and left the small pin-like shape on the end of his wand handle so he would not loose it in his infamously unreliable pockets. What woke Harry the next morning was the beginning of a racket that soon had the entirety of Gryffindor Tower curiously moving into the common room. It started with the panicked and chaotic rustling of bedsheets and papers. 
Come on Scabbers you know it's not safe for you outside of your cage with that beast of a cat around. Here Scabbers Scabbers Scabbers. What the bloody hell are you doing? Dean Thomas had been woken by the same rustling and panicked whispers that had started to raise Harry from his slumber. At Dean's short exclamation Harry shot up and what he found was their dorm in complete disarray. Clothes were flung on top of everything, papers were strewn about on the floor in no particular order, trunks had been overturned, there was a red fuzzy sock sticking to the mirror on the far side of the room for some reason. Seamus having been woken by Dean as well took in the scene and let out his own exclamation on seeing his belongings flung about. Ron what the hell are you doing? Ron frantically turned around panic written across his face. Scabbers is gone. Guys you have to help me I can't find him anywhere. He wasn't even under the bed and I looked, indeed the space around Ron's bed was the worse off. The mattress had been taken off of the frame, the curtains were flung on top of themselves, the contents of his trunk was completely emptied out, and on top of the heap was a rat cage conspicuously absent of any occupant, looking torn apart and disheveled itself. Harry had finally got his wits about him and swung his feet over the side of his bed. Ron calm down. He's got to be here somewhere. Who would want to take your rat anyway? Ron turned to his friend. I'm not going to calm down because there is only one thing that would want to make scabbers disappear and it has claws and teeth and can get into our dorms. Harry winced at his friend's accusation because it was true. When they stayed at the burrow before the start of term both Harry and Ron had seen Crookshank's figure how to open a door. The boys had thought it creepy while Hermione cooed about how smart her little man was. Unfortunately Ron had seen the resigned look in Harry's face as well as the wince that followed and he lost it. Ron. Just wait a sec oh god that stupid ugly cat has eaten scabbers. I knew it. I knew that cat was no good. That's it. This is the last straw. Ron's face was in the process of turning a shade of red that would make any Weasley matron proud and he thundered down the stairs to the common room. Harry was jumping up out of his bed trying to catch up to the angry redhead but it was no use. Hermione, your bloody cat ate my pet rat, he ate it, the least you can do is come down here and tell me you're sorry. When Harry made it to the common room it was with the rest of the third year boys behind him and the cries of, oi, and, what the bloody hell, from the other years they had descended past with such a racket. Slowly those boys too made their way down the stairs. Ron was pounding on the bottom step and the walls of the staircase that led to the girls' dorms, screaming Hermione's name. There were girlish shrieks at the racket and frizzy heads poking themselves out of the girls' dorms glaring at the culprit at the bottom. Finally a particularly frizzy explosion of hair stepped out of the third door. Ronald Billis Weasley you will stop screaming at me right now or there will be consequences, Hermione shouted back down to Ron as she stepped onto a landing in the staircase, her wand clenched in her hand and shooting sparks. Ron did not stop shouting at Hermione. What are you gonna do that your stupid cat hasn't already done for you? Are you gonna let it eat me too then? Hermione marched down the stairs about to bowl Ron over but Ron was not backing down and held his ground at the bottom of the stairs. The difference in height that would usually be apparent between Ron and Hermione was absent as Hermione came to a stop on the last step. They stood nose to nose. Hermione was no longer shouting but speaking very sternly. Just what on earth are you talking about Ronald? Ron swallowed and he growled. Your stupid cat. Eight. My. Rat. The adrenaline of anger was staring to wear away and Ron was on the downward spiral towards outright grief. A flash of comprehension crossed Hermione's face and she repressed a sigh at the impulsive stupidity of her friend before she clenched her teeth and spoke. Ron, Crookshanks has been sleeping on my feet the whole night. It's not possible for him to have eaten your rat because I would have woken up if he had moved. Ron huffed through his nose. So I guess you're just the princess and the nettles then. It's completely impossible for you to sleep through anything because of course you would wake up to tend to precious little crookshanks. Hermione's hair almost seemed to expand as she glared back at the insult. Did you even look for him or did you automatically assume that crookshanks had put the balding little thing out of its misery? Ron's eyes were staring to get irritated and bloodshot. Of course I looked for him. I turned the whole dorm upside down but I couldn't find him and you know why? It's because that bloody cat ate him. Your pet hell spawn ate my rat Hermione. Scabbers is dead because of you and you won't even say sorry. Because it's not my fault. That bloody cat has had it out for Scabbers since you decided to buy it. I tried to tell you to keep the stupid thing away but you wouldn't listen. 
How could Crookshanks even? It learned to open doors, Hermione. Ron's voice cracked and Hermione recoiled her own eyes becoming glassy. As she was about to open her mouth Neville managed to wiggle to the front of the crowd. Ron come on. You don't really know if Hermione's cat ate scabbers. We should go back up to the dorm and look. I lose Trevor for days sometimes before he turns back up. We can still find him. Ron turned to the intruder with new anger. Nobody cares about your stupid toad Neville, Ronald Weasley. Detention. 20 points from Gryffindor for insulting a housemate. Everyone back to their dorms to get ready for breakfast. The room went silent as they all turned to look at Professor McGonagall who had just entered the common room, a first year hiding behind her legs. When no one moved she spoke again, get, and there was a great rush of feet back up the stairs from both the girls who had crowded the staircase behind Hermione and the boys who had gathered behind Ron in the common room. Line break Neville looked around for Hermione in the greenhouse, but she still wasn't there. There was a horrible feeling of both guilt and relief at the fact that it looked like Hermione was so torn up over the fight that she was going to skip class. He was guilty because he knew what had actually happened to Ron's rat, he was relived because he wouldn't have to sit next to Hermione and know that he actually knew what happened to Ron's rat. When Professor Sprout started to move towards the front of the room to take attendance Neville finally decided it was safe to relax in the knowledge that Hermione, for whatever reason, wasn't coming. Thanks for sticking up for me this morning. Neville let out a shrill squeak as he jumped in his seat. His reaction only garnered a glance from the rest of the class before they turned back to the front of the room. Neville was startled easily and the rest of the class had been disturbed by his yelps of surprise often enough to find them uninteresting. Neville's face was flushed as he responded. H. Hi Hermione. When did you get here? Hermione seemed to become nervous herself at the question. Only a moment ago. I was running a little late this morning. I meant it though. Thank you for saying something. You know it's very possible that something else happened to Ron's rat besides Crookshanks having gotten a little peckish. Neville's blush refused to retreat as Hermione brought up the lost rat again. Uh huh sure. Hermione looked at Neville a little strangely, concerned that he was nervous about something. Neville are you alright, your neck is flushed. Neville tried to smile reassuringly and nod his head but it came out more like a jerk of his head and a grimace. Hermione was clearly not convinced and in a panic Neville furthered the conversation. D do you really think Crookshanks couldn't have gotten into the dorms? Can he really open doors? Hermione looked down now at her hands in her lap. Yes. He's a smart little cat and if he wants to he can get into a room with a closed door. But Crookshanks wouldn't do something like eat Ron's rat. He knows he's not supposed to and I'm relatively sure he was with me the entire night. Neville looked at Hermione a little confused. Relatively, it was Hermione's turn to flush as she nodded. I'm not exactly a light sleeper, nothing close to Ron, but, oh Neville what if Crookshanks really did eat Scabbers? Ron has been looking for him all morning and he still can't find him and Scabbers has never run away like this and who else would want to make Ron's stupid ugly rad disappear? What if it's all my fault? Ron was so upset, Hermione's blush crept up to her cheeks as she turned her head as if to hide her face behind her frizzy mane. Neville panicked as he watched a tear crawl down Hermione's cheek just before it disappeared behind a wall of hair. But Crookshanks didn't eat scabbers. Hermione took a slow breath in before she turned back to Neville. Thank you Neville, but we can't prove anything the door was locked, on the cage. Unless Crookshanks has thumbs I'm sure he couldn't have gotten in there without a ruckus. A person would have had to sneak into our dorms and open the cage to get Scabbers out. Crookshanks had nothing to do with Scabbers you have to believe me. Hermione paused at the determined look on Neville's face. The color started to drain from her own cheeks as her thought process jumped tracks. Neville, do you know something about where Scabbers has gone? Neville's eyes opened widened for a brief moment and all of the color drained from his face. He turned to face forward and got out his things for taking notes. And no of course not. I just have a lot of experience with missing pets you know and there are a lot of times where I thought maybe an owl had eaten Trevor and it didn't turn out to be true so I just thought. Mr. Longbottom, Miss Granger I would like to get class moving, if we could. Both Hermione and Neville looked up towards the front of the room slightly mortified at Professor Sprout's kind face. They both mumbled a, yes ma'am, before they fell silent and started to copy what was already on the chalkboard. Hermione didn't miss the way Neville sighed when Professor Sprout started her lesson, or the way he wouldn't quite turn his head to make eye contact with her the rest of the hour. 
The very first thing Batman did when he got back to his rooms was to put the unconscious rat in the claw-footed tub in the bathroom while he moved to seal up all of the entrances to his apartment. Nightmare who had been hanging from the edge of the bookcase, squeaked and flapped at the quickness of Batman's movements. Batman ripped the sheet from his bed, once again, and put it to good use by tearing it in half and stuffing it in the gap under the doorframe. Next he took the remaining half and tore that into thirds to use elsewhere. Curiously, there was no drain in the tub, which is why Batman had felt safe leaving the rat inside it when he went to go get the supplies he would need. There was however a drain in the sink and a drain in the toilet. He took one third of the sheet and plugged the drain in the sink, and another third to plug the pipe in the toilet. This took care of all of the holes in his rooms that the rat could use to get out. This way even if the rat woke while he was restraining him and slipped out of his grasp, the rat would have nowhere to go, or be slowed down enough for Batman to recapture it. Batman had one-sixth of a queen-sized bedsheet left and he wasted no time putting it to good use. Batman used the razors on his gauntlets one last time to cut the section of fabric lengthwise into two-inch wide strips. When the entire sheet was finally gone, the last of it made into the strips in his hands, Batman moved back to the bathroom to restrain his prisoner. Laying the strips of fabric over the edge of the tub and sitting on the closed toilet lid, Batman picked the still asleep rat up from the tub and started to wrap the strips one by one around the little rat's body tight as he could get them without cutting off circulation or constricting his little lungs. He tucked in the rat's feet against its body and spooled the strips around them, turning the rat effectively into a legless lump with a head and a tail. The best the rat would be able to do was roll around. Saving the last strip, Batman took off his gloves and carefully frayed the fabric. He picked out the long threads to use to tie the little creature's mouth shut. He wound the thread tightly around the little mouth making sure that the pest would not be able to open it to chew its way out. Only its little twitching nose was left exposed so that it could breathe. This was not the first idea Batman had had about restraining the rat. No, on the entire trip back to his apartments he had attempted to think of ways to construct some sort of cage or box for the vermin. But Batman had a fair amount of experience with rats in general. It was a constant battle to keep them out of the Batcave. He knew that trying to cage a rat that was truly intent upon escape was near impossible. He had seen shoe marks in some of the metal housing he used to protect his computers in the cave. There was nothing that Batman could think of in his current inventory that would be able to hold up to the persistent teeth of a rat that was hell bent on escape. It was truly only the teeth that Batman could not find a workaround for. If he could somehow keep the rat from being able to chew anything, he would have many more options available to him. That is when it had occurred that the rat truly did not need a proper cage at all. Thus he had thought of simply tying the rat up and keeping it from moving to keep it contained. It could struggle all it wanted but it was not going anywhere if it could not run, wiggle, or squirm away from its binds. Now all the materials he would need were some type of rope and something to keep the rat from chewing the binds. Both of which Batman could fashion out of the materials he had in his apartments. Just as Batman was tying the very last knot and tucking in the last two loose ends, the rat in his hand started to twitch. Turning the rat over to look at it Batman felt a wiggle and then it opened its eyes and started to squeak as loudly as it could. Nightmare, who had been idly poking around the top of the bookcase waiting for Batman to settle down, let out a returning squeak and quickly flew to the bathroom, landing atop the shower curtain rod, to see what the origin of the noise was. Batman let out a short huff as he glanced to the bat who had just flown into the bathroom before he turned his attention back to the rat in his hands. The rat wiggled as best as it could with the binds that restricted it. It thrashed its head and whipped its tail fruitlessly, shrieking in panic through its closed mouth. It was with little fanfare that Batman held the struggling vermin up to eye level and said one thing. Peter Pettigrew. Immediately the rat shut up and became still. It looked directly into Batman's white slits unnaturally attentive for a second too long to be an accident or a reflex, before it was back to struggling and shrieking as loud as it could. Batman's scowl deepened exponentially. There was of course no concrete evidence as of yet for the rat's true identity, but the reaction of the rat to this specific name was telling. Batman slowly started to squeeze his fist. You're supposed to be a dead man Peter. Continue to whine and I might be persuaded to fix the oversight. The rat quit its screeching abruptly once more its breaths now coming in short little pants. Batman didn't relax his fist. 
The second silence only further confirmed in Batman's mind what was rapidly changing from hunch to workable theory. Batman examined the rat in his fist once more before he continued to speak. If I am correct, you have been running for 12 years. In my line of work there are only two types of people who run for so long, Batman paused tightening his grip on the rodent ever so slightly, causing it to wheeze, those who have tremendous fear, and those who are truly guilty. Know that I will find out which you are. And when I do, Peter Pettigrew, you will get the justice you rightly deserve. Batman aimed a particularly intense glare at the now silent rat before he relaxed his fist and set the now limbless rodent back into the tub. As soon as Batman stood and walked out of the bathroom, Nightmare swooped down menacingly over the tub with an awful screech before darting out after Batman and landing upon his shoulder. Batman checked over his prisoner one last time before discerning that the binds would hold for at least a day. He set the lump of rodent back into the tub having just unwound the threads around the rat's mouth to allow it to get a drink of water and to eat a bit of food. Though Batman was tempted to let the annoying thing go without until he could get back to his rooms. All night, every half hour or so the rat would start to squeak in its pitiful way. And Nightmare every half hour or so would let out a much scarier sounding shriek and fly from his perch on the bookcase in the bedroom to harass the little lump in the tub by flapping his wings and snapping his teeth until he became quiet. Nightmare let out a series of clicks as he draped himself over Batman's shoulder, clinging to the fabric of his cape there. Batman sighed and gently picked the little bat up off of his shoulder and placed him in such a way that he could latch onto the shower curtain. He seemed reluctant until Batman spoke. I need someone to watch him. At this he happily clicked and grabbed with his feet onto the shower curtain. He let out a warning shriek at the rat in the tub as he readjusted his wings around him to start resting for the day. Batman went about his day not really paying attention to anything that was going on in classes. His attention was already focused on what he was going to do about his newest prisoner. Batman took his usual seats in his usual classrooms and did his best to blend into the walls around him. Most of the time he was only attentive enough to recall the incantation or the theory that was being taught before he would absorb himself in his other tasks. Before his latest foray into the world of magical criminal justice, Batman had been attempting to create a full blueprint of a Zeta beam from memory and from what theory he knew. He had more than a few pieces of parchment crammed full of notations and designs of what he could recall or deduce based on his own knowledge of how teleportation worked, but Batman himself was not an expert in the construction of Zeta beams. It was true that he had enough knowledge of metaphysics and engineering to maybe possibly build a functioning machine from scratch if he could get the supplies, space, and time that he needed. But he himself had not been an integral part of the technology's development, he had kept a close eye on the project, of course. But he had left the actual building of the machine to other scientists and heroes, having had other more important projects to attend to. Batman knew enough of the machine to repair it when they were short-staffed on the watchtower. He knew the general concepts that went into making the machine operational, but he was no expert. Building a Zeta tube from scratch was a massive undertaking even when all of the resources to build one were available. Building one alone, without easy access to resources, was going to be near impossible. So while Batman had not given up on the notion, as it was one of the few options available to him, he had not been overly concerned about it either. In order to even make building a Zeta beam plausible he had to first cultivate enough social and political capital in this world to get himself the resources he would need. So far that had been his main focus orienting himself in this world and its operations. Thus his involvement with the case of the escaped mass murder Sirius Black. Beyond the fact that an escaped convict was putting the children of a school, its staff, and himself in danger, it was an opportunity for him to establish himself in this world as a figure to be reckoned with. It was obvious that this case was a media sensation, as well as a political catastrophe on the part of the Ministry of Magic. He had done enough research in the archives of the library to know this. If he could bring down this criminal it could go a significant way towards building his reputation, and getting him closer to getting back to his own world. Currently he was in a transfiguration class attempting to hash out some of the possibilities for the case and the rat he was currently holding hostage in his bathtub. He had filled up an entire sheet of parchment with notes on his investigation. None of it was English, of course, it was all written in Kryptonian. He had not seen anything to suggest that a Justice League or a Superman existed on this world and if they did, anyone with the ability to read Kryptonian coming into contact with his notes was slim. 
His main focus was figuring out how to get substantial proof to support his hypothesis that Peter Pettigrew was an animagus and had been in hiding for 13 years for some as of yet unknown reason. The fact of the matter however, was that Batman didn't have the knowledge or tools in this world to come up with enough evidence to prove or disprove his theory. Batman was rapidly coming to the conclusion that he knew very little about magic and that was going to be a very large problem. Especially if he did not have the aid of his electronic gadgets to help him with collecting sufficient evidence. The increasingly painful and very unfortunate truth was, Batman was most probably going to need some sort of help. Mr. Batman. Is there something I can help you with? Batman looked up to Professor McGonagall who was standing before his desk her arms crossed. She tapped her finger against her arm impatiently. Batman looked up from his paper. He noticed the way that she stood stiffly as if uncomfortable or ready to fight at a moment's notice. His answer was a simple, no well then perhaps you could take a small break from whatever it is you were doing and participate with the rest of the class. Batman paused to look around and took a conscious note for the first time that the rest of the class had been attempting to turn jewelry boxes into turtles for the better part of an hour. A jewelry box that had sprouted stubby little turtle legs tumbled off the side of a table with a clatter. He took a moment to appreciate the absolute absurdity of what was going on around him before he turned his attention back to his case notes, once again answering with a simple, number. Excuse me? No I do not believe I will be participating this class session. The rest of the room suddenly got very quiet. Batman resisted the urge to sigh as he felt the stares of the class rest on him. He noted the professor in front of him shift her weight. Oh, and why, might I ask, is that so? Batman allowed himself a brief moment to collect himself before he put down the quill he had been using and gave all of his attention to the professor before him. I believe that we can both agree my participation in these magic classes is a farce at best. I have no use for magic, beyond my getting it under control and understanding its ramifications, which I have already done. Therefore it would be a better use of our time, if instead of becoming acclimated, that I would instead focus on attempting to return to my own dimension. Would you not agree that attempting to return to my own dimension is a better utilization of my time than learning to turn jewelry boxes into turtles? Complete silence from the rest of the class. Professor McGonagall attempted to remain stern as she crossed her arms tightly over her chest. She opened her mouth, but found that she had nothing to say. Batman merely nodded at her, as if she had agreed wholeheartedly with what he had just said. Exactly. So to satisfy both the headmaster and my own sensibilities, I have elected to attend class as directed, apply the bare minimum of effort to these magical studies, and instead use the time to attempt to find a solution to my problem. Today I don't believe my participation is necessary towards any long-term goals. Instead I decided to put effort into getting a way home. Do you find the explanation for my abstinence satisfactory? Professor McGonagall had had time now, to get her wits about her. She looked at Batman once again under a new light. She couldn't help but agree with what the man was saying because of the misgivings she herself had about Batman lingering with the student populace. Batman held her gaze without any visible anxiety. I will inform the headmaster of your grievances. You are dismissed. Batman stood from his seat and now loomed over the transfiguration professor. He gave her a very short nod before he gathered the paper and the quill he had been using and silently made his exit. Albus we have to do something different with him. He is more aware of the fallacies in his situation than you seem to be. Exactly what purpose do you have for allowing this near complete stranger to wander unsupervised among the student populace? Dumbledore pursed his lips and leaned back in his chair. It was not too often that he was made to feel like a scolded child anymore. As it so happens Minerva McGonagall had a special talent for eliciting that response from him. Minerva, please. I don't Albus, Dumbledore now allowed himself to look despondent. We need him. For what exactly? Halloween decorations? He can protect the students, did I not just say? He is obviously very skilled Minerva. From what little I've witnessed, I do not doubt that he is a capable fighter. It is very true that we don't know a lot about where he comes from, but I think we know enough about who he is to keep him in the school. Minerva planted her hands on her hips and narrowed her eyes at the old man behind the desk. What exactly makes you think you know the man Albus? He's only been here for a few weeks. Minerva had to work very hard to keep from rolling her eyes when Dumbledore's eyes lit up and the corners of his mouth twitched at the question. Wasn't it you, Minerva, who came to me to report that Batman had helped a one Bethany Telema on the first day of class when she was having trouble? 
Dumbledore waited for a response but when it became clear that McGonagall was not going to give one he continued on. All of the teachers have been saying good things about him. Hagrid told me the heroic tale of how Batman saved Draco Malfoy from beneath the peddling claws of a hippogriff. Madame Hooch had only to say that he was helpful towards the young unconfident flyers when she was distracted. And I might have had to wheedle it out of Severus, but Batman seems to be helping all of the students he is paired with in potions. Mr. Lupin has had nothing negative to say, if maybe that the man is a little odd and makes the atmosphere of the classroom difficult. But not one professor has come up to me and reported that he has posed a danger to the students. Minerva composed herself before she let out a long exhale. Because he has not proved dangerous to the students yet, doesn't mean that he won't eventually. I think you are conveniently forgetting about the fact that this Batman character completely incapacitated a fully matured Whomping Willow, subdued a particularly horrific Bogart, and has attacked Severus on numerous occasions. All without the use of magic. We don't know who this man is. We don't even know his real name. You are being reckless with the children's safety and I will not allow it any longer. This Batman is no longer welcome in my classes. He has no desire to be there, and frankly he is correct in assuming that I did not want him there either. Dumbledore now looked sad. Minerva he could be a great asset to our cause. Think of the possib. McGonagall turned on her heel towards the door. I am thinking of the students we are charged to protect Albus. I suggest you do as well. And later I found this on my wand handle, and now I'm not sure what I should do. Bethany, Justin, and Mandy stared at Neville for a long moment in exasperation before they all huffed and said, Gryffindors. Neville blushed furiously and feebly defended himself with a small, hey. Mandy shook her head before she leaned forward and held out her hand, well I can tell you one thing, and that is that you're certainly not going to be keeping your little souvenir of the whole ordeal. It's bad enough that you've got the biggest snoop in the entire school on your back, you're not going to go around carrying incriminating evidence. When Neville hesitated for only a moment Justin scoffed, please don't be stupid Neville you've dug yourself a big enough hole as it is. With remorse Neville proceeded to pick the little bad shaped object off of his wand handle and drop it into Mandy's outstretched hand. Bethany patted Neville lightly on the back, it's alright Neville I'm sure you can have it back when all of this has blown over. I bet you could even put it onto a bracelet or something. Neville looked hopelessly between the three of them, but what are we going to tell Hermione and Ron? Mandy's head snapped up from her bag. What do you mean, what are we going to tell Hermione and Ron? None of us are going to tell anybody anything. There were nods from around the table while Neville just sputtered. We can't just not tell them. They are fighting because Scabbers disappeared. It's Ron's rat to begin with, don't you think he has a right to know? Bethany looked to the hands in her lap guiltily, while Mandy looked off into the corner. Justin only shook his head. Neville we can't just tell them about what happened. Think about this logically for a moment. You say you saw Batman sneak into your dorms last night. You rolled over and fell asleep before you saw him take any definitive action. So technically you don't know any concrete information to begin with about the whereabouts of Ron's rat. So we can't really prove anything one way or the other. Secondly if we told anyone your story, the only thing that is going to be accomplished is that Batman is going to get in trouble for sneaking into the Gryffindor's boys dormitory. That, I'm assuming, is against the rules, and Batman could be seriously punished for breaking them. Thirdly, we don't know why Batman would want to steal a rat in the first place. Honestly he doesn't quite seem like the type of man to go around stealing children's pets for the fun of it. There is something we obviously don't know about the situation and it could be very important. All he did, and we are technically assuming here since you didn't actually see anything, was break in and steal Ron's rat for whatever reason. It's not exactly a capital offense, it's just a rat, nobody is physically hurt or missing because of the act. The best option we have right now is to sit on the information and see what comes of it. Neville just sort of gapped at the little first year that this wellspring of analysis has just come out of before he turned to the Hufflepuffs at the table. What am I supposed to tell Hermione then? She's going to corner me sometime and I can't lie to save my life. She's not going to just leave me alone. Mandy sighed and leaned forward on the table. Look, Neville, if Hermione comes up to you and starts to ask you about the rat, you don't have to come up with anything clever. Just go blank. Make an excuse to get away and do something else or don't say anything at all. Hermione is already suspicious of you, and she's not going to let it go until she gets an answer. 
it's not like we're trying to throw her off the scent, you just have to stay quiet and not give anything away, sure it will be uncomfortable, but it's not hard. Bethany frowned and wrung her hands in her lap. Mandy had become something like her surrogate big sister over the last weeks and she was wary or questioning her, but still, lying seemed like a bad thing to do. I don't know. Maybe Neville is right. Keeping secrets like that doesn't sound very nice. Can't we at least explain to them that Hermione's cat didn't eat the rat without giving anything away? Mandy smiled at the lil first year, we could yes, but it would make things more complicated than they need to be. Gryffindors don't respect secrets the same way we puffs do Bethany. We know that sometimes keeping a secret means being loyal and faithful to a friend. It's like this. If I told you that I secretly think that Snape's robes are cool but that I wanted you to keep it a secret, you wouldn't tell anyone else right? Not even for a chocolate frog? Bethany quickly shook her head no Mandy patted Bethany on the shoulder and then continued, right? Now let's say that someone found out that you knew my secrets and wanted you to tell them. Would you try to lie and convince them that you didn't know my secrets, or would you just say you were sorry, but that you were going to keep my secrets for me because I am your friend? Bethany thought for a moment before she slowly nodded her head. I would just tell them they were out of luck and that my lips were sealed. Alright I guess that makes sense. But I still feel bad for Neville's friends. They don't know any different. Mandy sighed and gently squeezed Bethany's shoulder. Well Neville's friends also happen to be the biggest snoops I have ever met so don't feel too bad. It's a rare thing when those three aren't getting into someone's business. We just have to make sure that they don't get into ours. There was a somber silence around the table as the four shuffled their homework around to return to their study session now that the drama had passed. Before Justin dove into his charms essay he had one last question. Just what are you going to do with that little bat thing anyway? Now Mandy smiled. No one outside of Hufflepuff has ever found the Hufflepuff common room. I think it will be safe enough from prying eyes with me. Don't you worry. In the meantime, how far have you gotten on that potions essay? Snape has a particular way he likes the one on a contide done and without an upper year to tell you how he likes it there is no way you'll get a passing grade. Thanks for watching.